So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about the key issues when talking with Roman Catholics. And those key issues that lay the foundation of our disagreement is how we discern whether someone or something is truly of God or not, and how we interpret the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. That is the crux of the issue. That is the source of the disagreements. If we could come together and reason together, like the Lord says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, they will be as white as wool. So let us come together and reason with one another so that we can figure out how we can determine when, let's say, a spirit, an angel, visits us. How would we know if it's an angel from God or if it's a fallen angel? How would we know this? And when we're reading the scriptures, how do we properly interpret when people see it different ways? How, how do we come to a consensus? Now, this is very easily said, because actually trying to implement this with Roman Catholics, it's like pulling teeth, uh, you know, to somebody who's awake and doesn't want their teeth pulled. Right? That's basically how it is. These people do not want to reason with you. They do not want to lay down a solid foundation to build upon, to come to a consensus with you. They're like, no, I'm right. You're wrong. You submit to me. And that's the end of it. Don't, they don't want any conversation about it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. They're just like, that's how it is. That's that. Born a Catholic, die a Catholic. La, 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 la. So it's not very easily implemented. Because that's basically the reaction you get. Uh, an example I, uh, I would like to use is uh, a group I'm in on MeWe. MeWe, it's a, an, a site... Or program like Facebook and it has forums like Facebook and there's one that's a uh, Catholics answering non-Catholic questions but most of the time they don't answer your questions they just pummel you with questions in response to your questions so that you, you never get an answer um, and recently I was talking to a couple of the Catholics in there and one of them was talking to someone else about Praying to their guardian angel. And I was like, what? That's weird. Because nowhere in the scriptures does anyone pray to an angel. Yet alone to, directly to their guardian angel. Right? I'm not saying we don't have guardian angels. Just there's nothing in scriptures where anybody tries to communicate with them. Right? So when he said this, I was like, oh, that's strange. I was like, why... Do you want to talk with the created more than you seem to ever want to talk to the creator? Like you talk about praying to your guardian angel here. Other times they're talking about praying to the saints. Because in this forum, like every day they put up a post about the saint of the day. Uh, and, and then they'll put up stuff obviously about Mary and praying to Mary. And it's like, well, what about God? You guys like never really put anything about God and praying to God and Jesus and what Jesus has done for you, how Jesus died for your sins. 
and how he rose again the third day. No, it's about Mary and how great she is and the saints and how great they are. And then about the angels. It's always about the creation. So it's like, why didn't you want to talk directly to God? <clears throat> and I don't remember his exact response to that. A lot of times when I ask a question like that, I don't actually get a response that has anything to do with my question. So it basically just changing the subject saying, uh, basically, I plead the fifth. I'm not answering that is basically what they're, they're saying there. And uh, he was just talking about, oh, yeah, I, I pray to uh, my guardian angel. And I was like, OK, since you're not going to explain why you talk to the, your angel instead of God, how do you know it's your guardian angel, not a fallen angel? Right. Because this is the, the key issue. How do we discern whether something or someone is of God or not? And here with the Catholics, this is where the issue comes in. Because when I started asking him about it, he said, uh, what was the first thing? He, he told me a couple of different things. The first one he said was something like uh, the Holy Spirit. That was just his answer. I was like, how do you know that you're talking to uh, an angel and not a fallen angel? He said, the Holy Spirit. And I was like, okay, what do you mean? Uh, how do you know that the Holy Spirit's talking to you and not an evil spirit? And then he said, pray. And I was like, okay, so who are you praying to? Are you praying to God? Are you praying to Mary? Are you praying to saints? Are you praying to your guardian angel? Who are you praying to? Because you need to be clear on this because you pray to all kinds of people. You don't play to God alone. Like if to me, when you say pray, I'm assuming God, because that's the only person I pray to is God. But the Roman Catholic, you need to be clear because they don't, they don't just pray to God. They, they got a lot of people they'll pray to. I'm not even sure, but they might even pray to their dead uh, loved ones and, and friends. I'm not saying they do, uh, but they could. I don't know. They, they pray to other dead people. So it makes sense. But anyway, uh, the response was a lot of just like, I don't know, and changing the subject. Because I was like, hey, uh, well, who are you praying to and how do they respond to you? Right, because you're saying, I'm assuming you're praying to God, but I want to make that clear. Like, who are you praying to? And if it's God who's responding to you, how does he tell you that you're talking to an angel and not a falling angel? And the person just responded by saying something that made no sense. Years of practice, decades of practice. And I was like, so you pray to decades of practice? and Or God answers you by decades of practice? Like, it doesn't make sense. And a lot of times, I think they answer this way intentionally. Because they know that the questions are leading them to the truth and they don't want to get to the truth. You know, kind of like when you have a witness on the stand in court and the lawyer is going to ask questions to get them to face the truth. But the person on the stand doesn't want to face the truth. So their answers are going to have nothing to do with the actual questions. But the lawyer can't force them to actually answer and answer in a way that makes sense. So they just got to deal with it. They can go to the judge and say, like, what is this? And the judge can say, hey, answer the question. But even the judge can't force you to say anything. You can give any answer. You're like, hey, what's two plus two? You can say blue. Right? You can say whatever you want. It's an answer. Doesn't mean it makes any sense. and actually applies to the question. Right? But uh, that's usually how it goes with the, these Roman Catholics. But eventually this guy actually posted a meme that said exactly how you're actually able to determine whether or not someone or something is of God or not. And he said, okay, there's three parts. One, they speak in the name of the Lord only. So in Jesus Christ, right? Second is that whatever they say lines up with the Holy Scriptures. Right on there, just like Paul in Galatians, where he says, if anybody comes preaching another gospel, even if it's an angel preaching another gospel, let them be accursed. So 
you test them according to the scriptures. Paul was even tested by the scriptures in Acts 17.11, where he calls the Barians noble for searching the scriptures to see if what he said was actually in them. Right? So you, you test the angels, the apostles, and everybody by the scriptures. Right? But that also implies that you're able to understand and interpret the scriptures on your own. Like throughout history of the scriptures from Moses till Jesus, there was never this doctrine about you cannot read and understand the scriptures yourself, that you need Israel and the priesthood to interpret them for you. There was none of that nonsense. That didn't come around to the Roman Catholic Church, and all of a sudden they're saying you can't understand and interpret the scriptures. But I'll get to that in a moment. And then the third thing he said is that their prophecies come to pass. Right? But there, there is an asterisk next to this, because I can predict that your nose is going to be sore in the next five minutes. And you'd be like, oh, yeah? All right, let's wait. And then in four and a half minutes, I punch you right in the nose. You'd be like, see, I'm a prophet, <laughs> right? So the point being there is that if you predict something that you are going to cause yourself, that you're going to help actually come about and you have power to do it then that doesn't count like you look in the old testament the prophecies that are given a lot of those prophecies that are given actually happen when they're dead and gone right so they have no impact on it there's nothing they can do about it they just told you what god told them to say and they it happened when it happened right but if i'm going to tell you tomorrow there's going to be a package at your door. And then tomorrow I leave a package at your door. Well, I fulfilled my prophecy to prove that I'm a prophet. Right? So if some angel or somebody comes saying they're a prophet and they give you some prophecy of something they actually have an impact on or that they have inside knowledge on, right? Let's like say somebody's in the government and they know what the government's going to do. So they say, oh, in the next six months or by six months, such and such and such and such is going to happen. And it happens doesn't mean they're a prophet. It means they had inside knowledge. Right now, if they were going to say, oh, in a hundred years from now, the United States government is going to do this and that and that and that on this certain month. Well, then, hey, there, there's something to that. Right. So there is an asterisk to the predictions. Right. Not only that, there's one other thing. If you copy a prediction. So if I'm saying, oh, Jesus is going to return. Well, I'm just copying what the Bible said. It, it tells us Jesus is going to come back. So that doesn't make me a prophet. It, I'm just repeating what the Bible says, where it prophesies his return. Right. So that there's another asterisk to it. So this Catholic knows that that's how you determine whether or not someone is of, of God or not. But you see where the next key issue comes in is where how you interpret the Bible. Because the angels would tell them, or he said that specifically Michael the archangel is his guardian angel. Which is crazy, right? Michael the archangel is his guardian angel. And he talks to him. This is what he told me in a public forum. And if he, Michael's telling him, hey, to be Roman Catholic and to follow Roman Catholic doctrine, well, he's telling him to go against Scripture. So right there, he proves that that angel is really a fallen angel, a devil. It's this, this being that he's talking to is not of God. And I tried to talk to him about this by saying, okay, did... Muhammad really talked to Gabriel in the cave? Did Joseph Smith really talk to one of God's angels? I believe his name was Moroni or something like that. And he was saying, no, they were fallen angels. I was like, yes, exactly, because they don't line up with the scriptures. So wouldn't this also apply to you? And of course, it doesn't apply to him. Right? And again, the key issue is how the scriptures are interpreted.
And this is where another fella jumps in and just basically bashes my interpretation. Not that I gave one in this conversation, but just says in general from the past times we have talked that my interpretation is, is trash and bunk and you can't rely on your own interpretation. So my question is, well, how can you rely on your your interpretation or anyone's interpretation? Because he was saying, how do I know that I my interpretation is not clouded by Satan? And it's a very good question, right? But it also applies to him. How do you know that your interpretation is not clouded by the devil? Right? And if you're not using your own interpretation, whose interpretation are you using? And why are you using their interpretation? And how do you know their interpretation is not clouded by the devil? Because a lot of these Roman Catholics will say, I have to take the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation, which means I have to take the interpretation of the Roman Pope and the cardinals and bishops and their priests. But how can I trust their interpretation? I just blindly trust it? Why? Why would I do that? Why not trust, just blindly trust the Orthodox interpretation or blindly trust the Mohammedan interpretation or the Jewish interpretation or one of the many Protestant den den denomination interpretations? You have to actually give me a reason to follow the interpretation of the Roman Catholic Church. And then if you're saying, hey, interpretation can be blinded and clouded by the devil... How do you know their interpretation is not clouded? So this is where it comes to the actual foundation. And if we could just come to agreement on this, we would be fine. But I need to take a quick break right here. It's going to be nothing to you. Just going to be a... But I have to do something real quick. And then I will get into the foundation of how we are to actually interpret the scriptures, and then this will determine how we see if someone is of God or not. And then you decide for yourself if what I'm saying is reasonable. And, and just like that, I'm back. Right? It was like no time at all. So, how do we interpret the scriptures? I'm actually going to give... An example here, I might give two examples. And you know what, I will give two examples, because I have one off the top of my head here that I'll give you as well. Uh, but the first thing we have to do is take things into context and look at the grammar. Right? A lot of times people misunderstand things because they're not taking things into the context of how it's being said. And... They are not actually following along with what is being said in the first place. So they're not following the grammar. And they just take one verse or one key point and they build the whole doctrine out of it. When the rest of the scriptures don't line up with this doctrine that they came up with using one verse. And I'm going to give an example of that in a moment before I do. I'm going to give an example that just came to the top of my head here. If you are going through the book of Genesis and you read about how God actually sacrificed an animal or two to clothe Adam and Eve, you could sit there and speculate about what were the animals that God sacrificed to clothe Adam and Eve with clothes. And you could say it was a camel, it was a donkey, it was a gorilla, you could just name about any animal, even like, a, like an alligator. Who, who, what was it? How are you supposed to know? Well, you compare scripture to scripture. You read later on about how Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And you also see right after that, Seth, not Seth, Seth was the replacement for Abel. Abel offered up a lamb. So we can see that he's copying the example of God and what he did to clothe Adam and Eve, right? So you allow the scriptures to explain themselves. You don't just throw in whatever you want to throw in there. You don't have a vote. Oh, 10 out of the 12 bishops 
or apostles say it was a gorilla that was sacrificed. That's not how it works, right? God tells you how, what is what, and that's how it is, right? So you allow God to explain himself. It's the same thing you would do with anybody's books, letters, or writings. You allow them to interpret themselves. You don't interpret what they wrote for them, right? You do not uh, take someone's contract they made and reinterpret it for them. They tell you what it means, right? So we allow God to explain himself. And we're actually told this in Genesis where Joseph, Joseph tells us when he is presented with a couple of dreams from a couple of his jailmates there, that to God alone belongs interpretations. So we allow God to do the interpretation. As Jesus said, his words are spirit and they are life. So the words that are inspired by God, which means they come from his breath, his spirit, will interpret itself. And that's what we need to allow the Bible to do. So let's actually go through an example here. And this is probably where, if any Catholics were following along, this is where they jump off. Because the truth is going to be presented to them. And when the truth is presented to them, it's like sunlight to a vampire. And they're just stopping here. Uh, but let's let's take a look here in Matthew chapter 16. And we're not just going to look at the one verse here, verse 18, that Catholics will take and they build the whole doctrine. of. We're going to look at the whole paragraph so that we can understand the context. And I'm going to explain it to you the way the Orthodox Church interprets this. This is why the Orthodox Church isn't Roman Catholic, because the Roman Catholic Church built a whole new doctrine by twisting this scripture here. And let's get into this here. Verse 13 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What's basic grammar here? The first sentence of a paragraph is the topic, it's the subject of the paragraph. It goes on to say, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto him, but whom say ye that I am? So now he's doubling down on the topic. On the subject. Okay. Who do people say that I am? Okay, now who do you say that I am? Right? So it's a, this whole paragraph is about who Jesus is. And somehow Roman Catholics turn it into... Peter, he is the, the rock and foundation. He is not the actual subject and topic of this paragraph. It's actually what Peter says as the next verse is the answer. Verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right there is the answer to the question. That's who he is. Because the deeper question is not what people say he is or what the disciples say he is, but who is he actually? He's the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He's the Savior of the world. Right? That's what it's about. So Jesus goes on to say, at verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So when you follow the context, what Jesus is saying, This is true, Simon, this is who I am. And you are a rock. But upon this boulder I'm going to build my church, the boulder of your confession of who I am. I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because that's the context of the paragraph. And the Orthodox Church agrees with this. That's why they don't accept the Roman Pope and his authority. And it's about how the church is, that's built upon Jesus. Jesus is not going to have the hell prevail against him, not against Peter, 
Because this is where Catholics say, oh, you point out all of these errors with the Roman Catholic Church. So you're saying God's a liar? Jesus lied? No. I'm saying you misunderstand the scriptures. You don't understand basic English. This is something children can understand. This is fifth grade English. Literally, the King James Bible is fifth grade English. So there's no reason why you should be having this issue. here. It goes on to say, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and who, whosoever shall, thou shalt bind on, uh, I'm sorry, whatsoever, not whosoever, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that Peter was the rock uh, that the church is built upon. No, he says, tell no man that he was the Christ. Right? And this binding and loosen is not just given to Peter. As when you go to Matthew 18, what does it tell us? Well, there's two or three of you gathered together. I'm there with you. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. So this is not something given specifically to Peter. It's given to the church that's built upon Jesus Christ. So the interpretation of the Roman Catholic Church here, as here, doesn't line up with proper English. It doesn't line up with the context of what's being said here. And they have one verse that they take out of this paragraph, and they build a whole doctrine out of it that actually split the church into the East and West to the Roman Catholic Church, and into the Orthodox Church, because the Orthodox Church wasn't following along with their faulty interpretation. And then, like I said, Matthew 18 doesn't line up with how they interpret this, that the keys are given specifically to Peter. No, it's given to the church, which is everybody. We all make up the church. We all make up the body of Christ. And Jesus starts this paragraph and ends this paragraph about who he is. And that's the context. That's the rock. And we're going to jump to something real quick. I'll end up coming back to this and we're going to look at the Greek to make a double point here. When I come back here, focusing on this verse here. But first, let's come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. At verse 4, we're letting the Bible interpret the Bible. Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, at verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So you see how Paul is saying that the rock is Christ, and we're going to actually do the Greek for that in a moment too, when we come back to that. But there was one other passage in 1 Corinthians that I wanted to bring up that I forgot to bring up here. So we're going to jump to that real quick. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What Paul says here in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians in verses 10 and 11, he says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. So we laid down Peter, and another buildeth thereupon. But let every, every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. No mention of Peter. No mention of Peter being the rock of the church. No mention of being built upon Peter. No mention of Peter having the keys. No. Paul is just going on his own. Specifically chosen by God himself. Not worried about what the other apostles actually think. Because he, he was out preaching long before he actually met them. And he says that the foundation is Jesus Christ. Not Peter. And this ties into, as it says here, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 12. And that's actually what I was going to jump to next right here. Check out what Peter says. He talks about Jesus being the foundation as well. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, starting at verse 4, says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, to God by Jesus Christ. 
But you see here how Peter is saying that we are living stones, just like he is. Built up a spiritual house, the temple of God. As Paul says, we are the temple of God, right? And he calls us all holy priests. He goes on to say, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. This is the foundation of the church, the chief cornerstone. But Peter, he doesn't refer to it as himself. He says it's elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And, the, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they are appoint, were appointed. So here, Peter is clearly telling us that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone the foundation of the church. He doesn't say that he is. He's saying that we are just like he is, living stones built together upon Jesus. Nobody mentions Peter as the foundation of the church. Not even Matthew 16 actually says that. The Roman Catholic Church has to twist what is being said, obviously so, to support their doctrine. But again, we're going to come back to this and look at what the Greek says to make a point. The same thing with this next passage here in John chapter 1, at verse 42. It says, And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And you notice how there's no mention here when he meets Simon and calls him Peter, that he's the foundation of the church or anything like that. But again, we're going to look at this also. In the Greek, because the New Testament was written in Greek. It was the common language in the area of the, at the time. That's why you had the Greek Orthodox. But then the, the Roman Catholic Church split off from them when they had this interpretation here. But let's take a look here. Coming back to Matthew chapter 16, and verse 18, where Jesus says, Thou art Peter. He calls him Petros. Right? A stone or boulder. Right, And he says, upon this rock, Petra, a large mass of rock. So completely different, kind of like saying a pebble and a, a mountain, right? The two differences in the words here, in the vastness here. They're two different words because there's two different meanings. Like one of these, these Catholics I talk to, he always says words have meanings. And it's like, exactly. Peter and rock are two different words in English and in the original language, Petros and Petra. Peter is always Petros. He's never referred to as Petra. And some of the Catholics will say, well, that's because Petros is masculine and Petra is feminine, right? And the church is feminine. Yet Jesus is referred to as the Petra right here. And coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 again, where Paul says that Jesus is that rock that followed them. What is this word rock? Petra. And he says that rock, that Petra, was Christ. So he's saying Jesus is the Petra, the same word used here. That's the foundation of the church in Matthew chapter 16. And Peter himself says the same thing. 1 Peter chapter 2, coming back to this chapter, verses 4 through 8 here, and going to the Greek. He calls Jesus the chief cornerstone here, and he calls him the stone of stumbling, and he calls him the Petra of offense. He is the foundation of the church, not Peter. So you can see here, when we test people, such as the Roman Catholic Church and its clergy, to the scriptures, we can find them to be in error. Right? We can clearly read the scriptures, such as in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I believe it's Titus chapter 1, about how a bishop must be married and have children, showing that he can rule over his family well in order to be a bishop. There's no mention of anybody taking any vows as a Christian, especially not bishops taking a vow of celibacy. Yet this is what the Roman Catholic Church has for their bishops. If they are a bishop and they're not married, they have to take a vow of celibacy. This is not scriptural. Showing that they have an illegitimate priesthood. 
because we're comparing them to the scripture, right? That's how we determine whether someone is of God or not, is by the scriptures. So if they don't line up with it, there you go. Easy peasy, they're not of God. Right? And then, this is where the Roman Catholics say, well, you can't interpret it yourself. Why can't I? Who says I can't? And who can? Who's the interpretation supposed to rely on? Nobody actually gives me a, a solid answer here. They don't tell me why I can't do it. And they can't tell me why somebody else can. They have to use their own interpretation of something to come to that conclusion. So how can they rely on their interpretation, but I can't rely on mine? It's very inconsistent. It contradicts. It's hypocritical. It's fork tongue is how I like to say it. Anything that contradicts like that, that gives you double message, that's I can do it, but you can't. That's a, That comes from the serpent, that fork tongue, telling you two things at the same time that don't line up, going in two different directions. Right? And then coming back to John chapter 1, where Jesus calls Simon Cephas. Here it says a rock, right? But it says by interpretation. God knows that you're going to try to say Peter's the foundation of the church. So he says, which is by interpretation, a stone, which is the word Petros, where we get the name Peter. Cephas is his name in the Aramaic. But in Greek, since it's written in Greek, it's telling you with the interpretation, it's Petros, a stone. Peter is never referred to as Petrus, or Petra, I mean. He's always as Petros. Jesus is referred to, like we see here, as Petra. The one you see here, Simon, thou art a stone, and upon this boulder, I'm going to build my church. And Peter understood that, saying that we are all lively stones, just like it's interpreted in John chapter 1. Peter is a stone. He says, we are all living stones. And as living stones, we build up a spiritual house. So he, he puts us on equal footing with him, just like in Acts chapter 10, when he's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and they receive the Holy Spirit simply by believing. He says, hey, who should... should Who's going to forbid water that they should be baptized who have received the Spirit just as we have? Putting them on equal footing with Him. Right? But, uh, yeah. This is where uh, one of those Roman Catholics said, oh, this is how we can tell whether something is of God or not. By what it does with your ego. Right? And if it puffs up your ego, it's not of God. If it humbles you, then it's of God. But that's something he made up. It's like, where did you come up with that idea? Because for starters, God talking to you, is it, that boosts the ego right there. God's talking to me. Of all people, he's talking to me. That boosts the ego. But he sent an angel to me. I am so special. He's sending his angel to talk to me. That boosts the ego right there. Uh, Israel, their ego got boosted because they are God's chosen people. So you're saying that, that they weren't ever really God's chosen people. That was a lie because it boosts their ego. Mary was visited by Gabriel. And Gabriel said, hey, you're full of grace. You're full of favor. And you're blessed among women. That, that boosts the ego. So that's a lie. All right? And not to mention, the other Catholic I was talking to is saying that he has Michael, the archangel, as his guardian angel. That doesn't boost your ego? I mean, everything they're saying doesn't make any sense, especially since the Roman Catholic Church itself does just that. It boosts the ego, saying, hey, you do all these things, you will be righteous like God. You will have earned heaven. Because you would have been worthy by the things you have done and not done. That boosts the ego. I can be like God by jumping through these flaming hoops, doing the good deeds for God and my fellow man, jumping through these religious ritual hoops here, 
and keep in the Ten Commandments to the best of my ability, and if need be, suffering in the flames of purgatory, which is just the name people call hell who think they're going to get out. And you think, oh, I'm doing this and that my, my suffering and my good is just going to dissolve away my bad somehow and change my desire, and I'm no longer a sinner where I desired it to sin in the first place. You think all that makes you on par with God, where you're worthy to be saved. How does that not boost the ego? The gospel, that's humble pie because it's telling you, hey, you're dog shit. You, your righteousness is dog shit. All the good you think you're doing, dog shit. Because you want to get into heaven, you must be perfect. And the flames of hell ain't going to make you perfect. The flames of purgatory ain't going to make you perfect. You doing good doesn't wash away your sin. It doesn't change your sinful nature. You still desire to sin. That's why you still sin. You like it. You don't, you're not fit for heaven. There's nothing you can do to make yourself fit for heaven. You're trash. You're a dog. You're a pig. That's humble pie. Realizing you need God to save you. And all glory is to him. Him alone. That's some humble pie right there. Roman Catholics don't... Their pride and arrogance is, and ego is too strong for them to accept such humble pie. They won't eat it. Even though it's the truth. They think, oh, I spent my life doing this. God's going to give me something for it. I didn't waste my time for nothing. I'm going to demand it of him. Yeah, have fun with that. Now that's arrogance. That's entitlement. And that's the message you're getting. So by this Catholic's definition, the Roman Catholic Church is not of God because it puffs up the ego. The gospel doesn't puff up your ego. It says you're just like everybody else. You need a savior. And you saved. You, well, then you're on the same level as everybody else who is saved. Nothing special about you. It's all about God. Right? And no, ego can't get in the way there. Because it has nothing to do with you in any way whatsoever. You could be like, oh yeah, God loves me. Willing to die for me. Yeah, and he's willing to do that for everybody. And right now there's billions of people on the earth. And how many people have lived before today that have died? He, he did it for all of them. Not just you. Right? Where's the ego? Where's the ego saying, hey... You're on par with everybody else so that you can come to God yourself just like everybody else and read the Bible and understand it yourself just like everybody else. You can't dictate to anybody else what's what and what is not what. That's humble pie. Message of the Roman Catholic Church. Only we can interpret the scriptures. Ego boost. You have to submit to us. Ego boost. We're the gatekeepers to heaven. Ego boost. You got to do what we say when we say it. Ego boost. We can decide whether you go to hell or not. Ego boost. I'm not saying this is what Catholics use to determine whether or not something or someone is of God or not, but it's what this specific Catholic used, so I'm mocking that, that very silly idea. So, with all that being said, thanks for watching, take care, and uh, may God be with you trying to establish this, this foundation with him. That's all I could say for that. So, thanks again for watching, and take care. Alright, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2 it says looking on to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith an author is somebody who writes and in Romans chapter 10 Verses 
16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested of the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested of the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble. For hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word? In John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified, and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless, you want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change, where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit, and become one with his Spirit. 
And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the spirit of God and God's spirit is life giving as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word, it is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? The only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump 
is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. He says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.